A COVID vaccine this fall, the CDC telling states to get ready. The presidential debate season is fast approaching, and Harry and Meghan just inked a major deal with Netflix. Here's what you need to know. Good morning. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Thursday, September 3rd. I'm Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Hey, Carlo, good morning. Hello, my friend. How are you today? Hello, my friend. I'm good. Uh, Jill, before we start, I said yesterday that the new iOS um, iPhone update didn't mention the COVID contact tracing. Well, Chris, one of our listeners, screenshot his update and sent it to me on Twitter, and it actually did mention it very prominently. So I either didn't see it when I did my <laughs> update or they, yeah, or they changed the app description after I did it. Um, I'm not sure, but either way, I just wanted uh, a little mea culpa there. Someone, Tim Cook listens to our podcast is basically what happened. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, my takeaway. Um, all right, let's, let's get to some news here. The CDC has reportedly notified all 50 states to be prepared for a possible coronavirus vaccine approval for healthcare workers by November 1st. Dr. Fauci has been saying in interviews that if the data is overwhelmingly positive, the government could start rolling out a vaccine to high risk groups before clinical trials are done. Still, many are concerned that the CDC is being pressured to deliver a vaccine or even an announcement of a vaccine just before the election. You know, I think that this Whoa. is going to be the October <laughs> surprise. Yeah, Del, this is going to be the, you know, we get the October surprise every four years, right? And I think this is going to be it this year. The FDA coming out like maybe the week before Halloween saying, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we got it. We're here. Now, it may very well be true that one of these vaccines are doing so well in stage three trials that they're comfortable putting it out before those trials are com are, are complete for the most vulnerable groups, like Fauci has been saying. But, you know, the thing that, that worries me is like in this country at this moment, like, you know, 40, 42 percent of people are, are going to believe it. The rest aren't. I mean, that's the problem with all of the damage that has been done to delegitimize, you know, our institutions, institutions like the FDA and the CDC. Yeah. You know, not just by Trump, but a lot by Trump. Um uh, you know, and if that happens, and by the way, I hope it does. I mean, that would, this would be this would be unbelievable if they were able to get this thing out um, by November. Uh, I, I think we're gonna, if that were to happen, we're gonna need people like Dr. Fauci, who's you know one of the one of the people that most people, most of the country still really trusts, to be out there screaming this, uh, you know, from the rooftops, right? Yeah, I mean, so you know, at first I was sort of like, well, listen, if there if it is looking like it's effective, why not get it out to health workers and and really high risk uh, people? However, um, I was reading, uh, I follow a bunch of epidemiologists and health experts on Twitter, and and they do long threads about this. So yeah. they say there's actually real harm in getting a vaccine out to the public before it is completely proven to be effective. So the goal with any vaccine is that it reduces someone's risk by at least one half. Okay. So that's the right. benchmark. Uh, Dr. Eric Feigl Ding, who's an epidemiologist with the Federation of American Scientists, which is a nonpartisan group. He says that deploying a weekly effective vaccine uh, could actually worsen the pandemic. So the reason is that if, if vaccinated people wrongly believe that they have a strong immunity to the virus, then they don't take other steps that are needed to actually protect themselves. Um, right. Also, it could interfere with the evaluation of other vaccines because apparently it would take a lot longer to figure out if those vaccines are effective. And and the, these doctors are arguing that what the FDA, that they, they've done enough in speeding up trials, right? Across the world, right? Not just here in the US. This is moving already at lightning pace. So we don't sure. need to go any faster. Let's get it right. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I just I don't know how many people are just have the faith in, you know, our, our agencies, our the federal government, that this wouldn't be you know, politicized that this wouldn't be the White House saying, look, we have to have some sort of thing come out. You know, we're, we're down in the polls. This is the Hail Mary. I, I, I really don't know. 
Um, and by the way, I just want to mention Dwayne Johnson, Dwayne, the rock Johnson and his family have all tested positive for COVID-19. He, he, uh, put out an Instagram video. He says they're all on the other side of the virus and doing well, but he said it was one of the most challenging and difficult things that they've gone through as a family. Yeah. Wow. That's, I mean, sort of like Tom Hanks, he said that, I think he came out recently and was like, this sickness is no joke. Like he was him and uh, his wife, Rita Wilson were really, um, you know, they were really sick for a long time. And I still remember when Tom Hanks, you know, when Tom Hanks came out in March and said he had COVID, that was like the turning point, right? I think that was really the moment that people were like, man, this thing is like the real deal. We really got to be worried about this. I know a couple of people who've had it and they've all been so sick. None of them yeah. have, at least the people um, who I'm friendly with had none had to go to the hospital, but they were sick for, for like three weeks and really sick, like could not get out of bed, yeah. 103 fever. Um, that is not, a, a, you know, I've never had a flu like that. That's, that's well, Jill, pretty also, severe. And it's not even just that. I mean, I think one of the one of the big problems with this idea that we can just sort of like, you know, get herd immunity in certain in like a college campus or something is we still don't have any idea what the long term effects of this disease are. Right. There's still these scary stories that come out about people having this sort of like mental fogginess, even though they've been recovered for months, um, you know, having, you know, weird smells and stuff like it's a, it, it, the scary thing to me is still how much we don't know, you know, just about the long term effects. Yeah, uh, heart disease uh, or heart yeah. so, uh, enlarged hearts. There's a hundred percent, and I, I feel like even personally, I remember a friend of mine had it, she, or she thought, like in January, um, she had traveled abroad and she she was so sick, and she was like, I think it was coronavirus, whether it was or not, I don't know. But anyway, I remember thinking, oh, you know, I kind of wish I had it back, you know, yeah. didn't know and it got sure. better and everything was fine. Um, now I'm not so sure. I don't, I don't think I ever want to get this virus. I, I mean, I actually no. know I don't want to ever get this virus. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm because we yep. don't know about the long-term effects of it. Um, and we also, you know, we also don't know if you get it, if you're then immune to getting it again, because the, the right. original conventional wisdom was you get it once and then you're done with it. Um, I do want to switch gears right now because we uh, there was another police killing uh, of a black man, this time in upstate New York. Protests erupted in the city of Rochester, New York overnight uh, over the death of Daniel Prude, who is a black man. He died of asphyxiation a week after an encounter with the police back in March. Newly released body cam video shows officers putting a hood over Prude's head um, and pressing his face into the pavement for two minutes. Officers had responded to a call from Prude's brother who said that he was having a mental health breakdown. This is a very, uh, very upsetting story. Um, the video's out there, but it's uh, it's it's pretty hard to watch. It's definitely this is a, definitely a story to watch. Um, I do also want to mention Jill. Uh, Joe Biden is going to Kenosha today. He will meet with the family of Jacob uh, Blake, or at least Jacob Blake's father, for sure. This is Biden's first trip to Wisconsin uh, since he's become the the nominee. Of course, you know, remember Hillary Clinton was slammed for for not going to Wisconsin in 2016. Um, that being said, polls, uh, new polls, just out yesterday have Biden maintaining a pretty solid lead in that state, which is interesting, right? Because it's sort of against the conventional wisdom that the arrest and the violence in that city over the last couple of weeks was going to hurt him. It doesn't look like it has, at least not yet. Uh, meanwhile, the crime stats for August in New York City are just out, and they are grim, showing that shootings more than doubled over the same period last year. Murders spiked by nearly 50%. Um, there have been 791 shootings in New York City this summer. That is a 140 percent rise over last summer. Uh, yeah. And uh, so Andrew Cuomo, our governor um, this morning uh, or last night, I should say, blasting President Trump over a story that was in The New York Post last night um, that reports uh, that Trump is trying to take federal funds away from, quote, anarchist cities like New York. I don't know. Did you see this story? It's pretty mm -hmm. uh it's an incredible, it's an incredible story. Um, uh, you know, I mean, that's not, uh, first of all, he can't really do that. This is more of like a, I think a, a, a political stunt, but, uh, Cuomo had some very harsh words for the president saying, quote, it's cheap, it's political, it's gratuitous, and it's illegal. New York city knows him for the joke that he is the people who know him best, like him the least end quote. Uh, and also said that Trump would need a quote army if he ever wants to walk down the street in his home city again. Shots fired. Wait, I didn't say. see that. 
line. I, I didn't see that. I just saw the yeah. it's cheap, it's political, gratuitous line. Uh, look, uh, there's a real problem in cities across this country. A violent crime is is on the rise. It's not just New York City. There's a lot of reasons for it, and something needs yep. to be done. It's a quality of life thing. It's it, it's it's horrible. Um, and I I just wish that politics would stay out of it. Um, I know a lot of people leaving New York City, and the, even the holdouts, the people who were like, "We're staying. We're in it for the long haul." Um, with kids and seeing the crime, that is, that is, that's what does it right. It's not the, it's not yeah. necessarily the restaurant closing up or working remotely or working in a small apartment. But if, if you have a kid and you're seeing crime on your, on your corner, you want out. Um, and that is going to destroy cities. Sure. Um, yeah. OK, the presidential debates are, are coming sooner than you think. The first Biden Trump debate will take place on September 29th in Cleveland. The moderators for all four debates, uh, three presidential and one VP, have been selected. So here's wh who, who it is. Chris Wallace of Fox News is going to host the first presidential debate. Steve Scully of C-SPAN, the second. Kristen Welker of NBC News, the third. And then Susan Page from USA Today. She's going to uh, handle the vice presidential debate. Krista Welker, I worked with her back at NBC. Um, I think she was after your time, probably. Uh, she's an incredible journalist, one of the hardest working people I've ever worked with. Um, so kudos to her. This is, a, this is an incredible. Behind gig. me, of course, right? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to, I knew you were going to say that. Um, Jill, I, okay. I, can we just talk about the debates for a second? The, the debates, the, the presidential debates this year are going to be so bananas. And honestly, I was thinking about this last night as, as a country, we deserve them. And I'm, you know, we have been through so much this year. Let us have these two old white guys. Let's face it. Neither of whom are really working with a full deck anymore. Just, you know, going at each other on primetime television. You know, maybe I don't get to see Tenet this year, but I at least will get to see that. <laughs> it's going to be nuts. It's going to be the must see TV event of the fall. I, you know what? I like this. I like this spin on it, Carlo. I, you could go with <laughs> it's going to be sad, but I think just entertaining. You know is what? Probably at this point, outlook. I think so. <laughs> Um, on to the economy now. The uh, total debt held by the U.S. government uh, will be exceeding the size of the economy next year, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. This is the first time this will ever happen uh, since the year immediately following World War II. This year, the debt is expected to be 98 percent of total GDP. While deficits had already been rising under the Trump administration, the pandemic made them soar. Uh, all the huge spending on stimulus, coupled with a lot uh, lower tax revenue, adding up to a cool $3.3 trillion deficit for this fiscal year. It's All not a said, fun Jill topic, but it's important. It, yeah, exactly. It's it's kind of boring, but it is important. And it's important because I don't think people should get freaked out about it. I mean, most economists say that governments really shouldn't worry about deficits when they're in the midst of a severe downturn, such as the one we're currently in. Right. Um, and that, you know, austerity is not the way th the way out. You actually have to keep spending. Uh, even a lot of Republican economists economists think this. And, you know, given the state of interest rates, it's not really a first ballot worry at the moment. It's still it's still important. It's still something to to that, that's worth covering. You know, that being said, Jill, does anyone believe for a second that if there were a Democratic president right now that this wouldn't be the biggest topic in conservative media, just like skyrocketing deficits? By the way, I, I'm going to make a little prediction right here. If Joe Biden wins the presidency, get ready to hear about the out of control deficit nonstop from, Janu from January 20th for the next four years. I would bet my life on that. Um. I, I I think you're probably right. Again, it's one of these issues is like it's uh, when you're in the middle of something like this, a lot of people, you know, you could kind of gloss over it. But it is important. And we are I, I know you're saying, you know, we should be spending and I agree. But, you know, we are this is our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. Sure. Our, yep. Someone eventually has to pay this off. Um Twitter, by the way, onto some tech news, has started adding context in the form of pinned tweets and descriptions to its popular list of trending topics. OK, this is all an effort to help users understand why a certain phrase, meme or tweet is going viral. This trending topics feature has sometimes been gamed by bots and trolls that use it as a clearinghouse to spread misinformation, conspiracy theories and hate speech. Activists and uh, some Twitter employees have called on the company to just get rid of the trending topics altogether or at least do it until after the election. 
which they should absolutely do, I think. I mean, this is a relatively new feature of social media and arguably, I think, one of the most odious. Um, you know, this is it, trending topics. That's what WikiLeaks was gaming in 2016 when they were releasing the DNC emails. This is how QAnon emerged from the fringe into the mainstream via trending topics on social media. You know, in the old days, I don't know if you remember, in the old days on Facebook and Twitter, um, in the old days, I mean, like 10 years back ago, I guess. when I was your age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, back in the glory days, uh, you, you sort of had, you didn't really know like what was trending, right? It was sort of like you had to kind of search for it or figure out what people were talking about. There wasn't just this sort of like sidebar, um, that, that tells you what people are talking about. And, you know, the problem with it is, you know, if you're maybe, if you're new to social media and you're not sort of like, you know, hardened by just like how many lies and and misinformation are on the internet, and maybe you see something like Pizzagate trending and you're like, Ooh, pizza, I like pizza. What's that? And then you click on and then you go down some, you know, rabbit hole, uh, conspiracy theory rabbit hole, you know, these companies like Twitter and Facebook, they do it because it keeps you scrolling. It keeps you, you know, keeps you on the platform, but, um, so they can serve more ads of course. But I, I, I think at this point it, it really should go away because it is doing real damage to the fabric of this country. Uh, yeah, I actually, I go on trending topics pretty much at least usually it's one of the things I first do when I wake up in the morning to see if what, what is, have I missed yeah. there is yeah. there I do find in, from a news sense it is kind of helpful um my biggest worry I I there was a point a couple maybe a month ago where you'd go on and trending topics were like Jews Jews in America I yeah. mean my heart like would drop yeah. when I'd see this I was yeah. like what happened okay um just for fun though i went on uh i'm on it now these are just the random things like okay trending in the united states just the word erica um and it's erica with a k um okay. and then this is what happens so you're like who why is erica trending so then you click on right. it and you try to figure it out and then you sometimes it's even a celebrity name and the whole thing is just about how they didn't die. Like it's people being like, oh, thank right. God, so-and-so didn't die. Um, so, I mean, in some ways it's entertaining, but when you talk about QAnon um, and and yeah. these obscure theories that are, are all of a sudden they're in somebody's trending topic, it almost makes it, it gives it a little bit of like validity. So yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there's a problem with this. I'm glad they're at least trying to put it into context. I think I, I, I do, I want do you remember when, um... I don't know if you remember this or not, but it was when we were doing the, when we were starting our morning show that we work on together at Cheddar and we were like trying to, there, there was a, a meeting with the producers. We were trying to like brainstorm fun segments. And I pitched this idea for a segment called uh, dead or canceled. And it was, it would be, we would, we would tell you a celebrity that was, or just a name that was trending on Twitter. And you had to guess whether that person had died or whether they had done something that had been canceled. But uh, that, that yeah. idea probably for, for the better was immediately shot down by our, well, by our boss. Well, right. Because I was thinking, okay, right. Cause I was like, we should do it and it should be, why is this trending? Right. Like right. We, that was it. It was like to pick a name. Why is this trending? And you're like, Oh, it should be called dead or canceled. I love <laughs> that idea, by the way, I, let's do it on this podcast. Uh, okay. So much trouble, but yeah, it would be funny. Um, okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, on that note, Facebook and Twitter this week saying they're seeing evidence of Russian hackers targeting voters in the U.S. again this year. ABC reporting that uh, the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, withheld an intel bulletin warning about a plot to spread misinformation about Joe Biden's health. Um Apparently, they they got there was this a, a pretty credible uh, intelligence report uh, a couple months ago that that talked about uh, Russian efforts to spread misinformation about Joe Biden and the criticism yeah, look, I mean, that gonna... it didn't really go anywhere in the White House. They yeah. didn't tell anybody I mean... about it. Right, which I think they probably should have. But I, I my hope is that uh, you know as a country we're much more sort of um you know. Uh, computer or social media savvy this this time around and just you know i don't i think hopefully fewer people are going to sort of fall for like pretty obvious you know russian misinformation attempts on facebook but that that being said i i don't know if I, that's a hope that's not a uh, i don't know that's to be the case well the problem is that um facebook is well so facebook twitter they're taking a lot of steps on the back end, right, to remove this type of video or remove doctored video or misinformation, label it as misinformation. Um, but the problem is it's it's always playing catch up. 
they're never yeah. doing it on the front end um, or maybe they right. are, but, but things still seep through the cracks. And so you have a situation where just, it just happened with Joe Biden, where a video that it was actually somebody else sleeping and it, whatever. And it was, yeah. yes. And it was, and it, and it was made to look like Joe Biden and millions of people had already seen it before it was taken right. down or labeled as, as a fake video. Um, so is the By damage the way, done? That video, it's not like that just appeared out of nowhere. That was the president of the United States, the social media director, who put that video out. So it's not like it's just like the Russians. <laughs> it wasn't are, just a random kid, this. yeah. Yeah, stuff, right. <laughs> Um, and finally, let's, uh, this is a good story. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have inked a major deal with Netflix that will have the former royal couple producing films, documentaries, and children's programming for, uh, Netflix. It's unclear what Harry and Meghan are being paid, especially since they have no experience, uh, in film or TV production. Maybe Meghan, Meghan does actually. Um, I but it's so. also not known how much either of them will appear on screen. The couple now lives in Southern California full time after breaking from the house of Windsor. I have a feeling they're getting paid more than I am to produce uh, for Cheddar. Maybe, I don't know, that's just a thought. You know, Jill, I, I, I am, uh, I think I'm prepared to start a Harry and Meghan backlash that, that to me feels very overdue. I don't know. Maybe I'm gonna maybe I'm gonna get my own backlash for this, but they're, they're starting to annoy me. I have to say, like, you quit the royal family. <laughs> they, they, okay, that's cool. Whatever. Like, do do what you're gonna do. Like, I I respect that. Good for you. Then they move to Los Angeles. They buy a 15 million dollar spread in Montecito, out with Oprah and Ellen, um, in that neighborhood. And they, then all of a sudden they decide they're gonna be like kingmakers in Hollywood. They're getting I, the reports are they're getting a hundred million dollars from Netflix. I don't know how true that is. You know, my wife was telling me yesterday we were talking about this. She, she knows a journalist who had covered them at a recent charity event and said she thought it was very strange because you know a lot of celebrities do this charity, but Harry and Meghan were the only ones to do it with an entire film crew in tow. You know, probably because they're doing something for Netflix. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm. Maybe it's the old me seeping through, and we're uh, and I'm being too cynical. But I'm 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 kind of done with them. I'm kind of done with them too. I actually, I knew this was the take you were going to go with because of the way that you had written this story, <laughs> saying <laughs> that how <laughs> that you didn't know what they were being paid because they had no experience in film or TV yeah. production. Again, Megan, Megan, uh, I don't know if she was ever machine. been behind the scenes, but she's, you know, obviously yeah. has experience in film and TV. Uh, but I'm with you, you know, okay. So the way I feel about this is sort of the way that I used to feel about when celebrities would get really big journalistic gigs like when oh, celebs would get oh. the hosting gig of, of the today show or another Don't give me stars. Sh yep. show that i would kill for and like spent right. years in small markets working for yeah. um and i feel or like, like if when, you're or, or jill or, or jill when beyonce guest edits like vogue or something like that that's what yeah, that's i mean what that, yeah. yeah so I mean, it's like it's like when celebrities get these cushy gigs that others have been kind of uh, working their tails off their whole life for. Um, and I would imagine that there are some people in this industry who are probably like, oh, you know, would kill for a penny of Netflix's money to produce something, sure. a, a screenplay that they've been working on since high school. But um, look, I, I guess the proof will be in the pudding. We'll see what they put out. We'll say this and then we'll probably all watch all of this stuff anyway. Of course we will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glued to their kids programming. I happen to love Harry and I do like Megan. I, I, but I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like the tide may be turning with them where people yeah. are, are going to. We're uh, starting the backlash right here today. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we, let's end it there. That's what you need to know for Thursday, September 3rd. See you tomorrow guys.